God's plan for mankind, from birth, life, death, and rebirth until immortality, for a perfect development. Throughout history man has always wondered with awe how he came into this world. How did he get here? How did he come into this world? Where did he come from? Where does he go from here? He worshipped the gods as guides to find answers to his birth and rebirth into this world. It is no wonder that the god of fertility features prominently among the gods of many cultures. Prominent among the gods that man worshipped were the gods of fertility, childbirth, life, death, and rebirth, beauty, female sexual power, protection of young mothers, pregnancy, childbirth, sustenance and agriculture. Each geographical region had fertility gods that varied in their functions. But all of them had one thing in common, they functioned together as the breeders of the human race, of plant life, of animal life and the care of the environment. We shall limit our scope to human husbandry and show how humans are developed through the ages, from the first incarnation until immortality and equality with the angels is attained. The gods of human husbandry has featured throughout the history of man. In ancient Egypt, some of the fertility gods of R, Hathor, goddess of music, beauty, love, sexuality and fertility. Isis, goddess of motherhood, magic and fertility, Osiris, god of the afterlife, the dead, and the underworld agency that granted all life, including sprouting vegetation and the fertile flooding of the Nile River. Tauret, goddess of fertility and childbirth. Hurishaf, god of creation and fertility. There are yet seven more. The Aztec had Kaimalma, goddess of fertility, life, death, and rebirth, Quidlikwe, goddess of fertility, life, death, and rebirth, Donakatakuthli, god of sustenance, Donakashwatl, goddess of sustenance, Tanantzi, Shochiketzil, goddess of fertility, beauty, female sexual power, protection of young mothers, pregnancy, childbirth, and women's crafts. Shochipile, god of love, art, games, beauty, dance, flowers, maze, fertility, and song. Quetzalcoatl, god of fertility, wind, water, and chocolate. How do these gods breed mankind? What is the purpose of man's birth and rebirth into this world? Is there a pattern in man's coming and going out of this world? Is there an end to man's birth and rebirth? Let us now take a look at how God organize man's birth, life, death, rebirth and development until he attains immortality and the status of angels. An overview of the essence of life, of birth and rebirth across the globe, from the past and the present will give us a good perspective on the matter at hand. The word reincarnation derives from a Latin term that literally means entering the flesh again. Reincarnation refers to the belief that an aspect of every human being, or all living beings in some cultures, continues to exist after death. Or consciousness or something transcendent which is reborn in an interconnected cycle of existence, the transmigration belief varies by culture and is envisioned to be in the form of a newly born human being, or animal, or plant, or spirit or as a being in some other non-human realm of existence. An alternative term is transmigration, implying migration from one life, body, to another. The term has been used by modern philosophers such as Kurt Gödel and has entered the English language. But we are not into the subject of transmigration. The Greek equivalent to reincarnation, metempsychosis, derives from meta, change, an M. Psychone, to put a soul into, a term attributed to Pythagoras. Another Greek term, sometimes used synonymously is palingenesis, being born again. Rebirth is a key concept found in major Indian religions, and discussed using various terms, reincarnation, or puniranman. 
These religions believe that this reincarnation is cyclic and an endless samsara, unless one gains spiritual insights that end this cycle leading to liberation. The reincarnation concept is considered in Indian religions as a step that starts each cycle of aimless drifting, wandering or mundane existence, but one that is an opportunity to seek spiritual liberation through ethical living and a variety of meditative, yogic, marga, or other spiritual practices. They consider the release from the cycle of reincarnations as the ultimate spiritual goal, and call the liberation by terms such as moksha, nirvana, mukti and kaivalya. In the Christian religion, the repeated comings of the prophets implied that people do get reborn into this life. Elijah had a spiritual weakness that he had to overcome. He feared death in the hands of Jezebel, the patron of the prophets of Baal who slew the prophets of God. 1 Kings 19, 1 And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. 2 Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. 3 And when he saw that, he arose, and went for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. 4 But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die, and said, It is enough, now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. Although God did not end his life as he requested, he sent a chariot of fire to translate him to heaven, but Elijah had to face the death he feared in the Old Testament in a future lifetime in the hand of Herodias, the incarnate of Jezebel. The law of God compels us to be faithful unto death in the performance of our duties and trust God to grant us an incorruptible body at resurrection. Matthew 14 1 At that time Herod the Tetrarch heard of the fame of Jesus, too and said unto his servants, This is John the Baptist, he is risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. 3 For Herod had laid hold on John, and bound him, and put him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife. 4 For John said unto him, It is not lawful for thee to have her. 5 And when he would have put him to death, he feared the multitude, because they counted him as a prophet. 6 But when Herod's birthday was kept, the daughter of Herodias danced before them, and pleased Herod. 7 Whereupon he promised with an oath to give her whatsoever she would ask. 8 And she, being before instructed of her mother, said, Give me here John Baptist's head in a charger. 9 And the king was sorry, nevertheless for the oath's sake and them which sat with him at meat, he commanded it to be given her. 10 And he sent, and beheaded John in the prison. 11 And his head was brought in a charger, and given to the damsel, and she brought it to her mother. 12 And his disciples came, and took up the body, and buried it, and went and told Jesus. Jesus responded by revealing the nature of John the Baptist to his disciples. He said John the Baptist was an incarnation of prophet Elijah of the Old Testament. Matthew 11, 11 Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. 12 And from the days of John the Baptist until now the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. 13 For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. 14 And if ye will receive it, this is Elijah, which was for to come. 15 He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Having proved for himself that God is also a God of the flesh, John the Baptist continued his work as part of the mission support team of Jesus. John appeared together with Moses in his old form as Elijah of the Old Testament during the Transfiguration. Matthew 17, 3 And, behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah talking with him. For then answered Peter, 
and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here, if thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah. 5 While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold a voice out of the cloud, which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, hear ye him. 6 And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face, and were sore afraid. 7 And Jesus came and touched them, and said, Arise, and be not afraid. 8 And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man, save Jesus only. Another reference to reincarnation this time as part of the growing up of humans as students formerly put under the gods, rulers and the elements of the zodiac is from Paul in Galatians. Galatians 4, 1 Now I say, that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, two but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. 3 Even so we when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world, for but when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law. 5 To redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Six And because you are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. 7 Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. But what about reincarnation in Kabbalah, Hinduism and Buddhism? Gilgul, Gilgul Shemot or Gilgul Yihan Shemot is the concept of reincarnation in Kabbalistic Judaism, found in much Yiddish literature among Ashkenazi Jews. Gilgul means cycle and Shemot is souls. Kabbalistic reincarnation says that humans reincarnate only to humans unless God chooses. Rebirth or reincarnation in Buddhism refers to the teaching that the actions of a person lead to a new existence after death in an endless cycle called samsara. We shall know the truth soon. However, the Buddhist, Hindu and Jain traditions have differed, since ancient times, in their assumptions and in their details on what reincarnates, how reincarnation occurs and what leads to liberation. Let the Bible's viewpoint guide us on the doctrine of human husbandry, because of its simplicity, and detail. According to the Bible, there are three curricula for developing humans. The first and primary curriculum is the wheel of his cart. Isaiah 28, verses 27 to 28. This wheel of the husbandman or the gods is what Buddhism and Hinduism call the wheel of life or samsara. Let's begin the doctrine of human husbandry by explaining how the zodiac wheel, samsara, or the wheel of his cart is operated. We shall also include the legal provisions of God for every human being in the operation of the Wheel of Life. God divided the seven stages of the Wheel of 84 into seven wheels. Each wheel is a stage of human development, divided into twelve incarnations or houses. The house is the collection of issues to be studied per lifetime. He divided the seven stages of the Wheel of Life into three categories or divisions. The first division is made up of only one wheel. This is the Foundation Wheel. It is for the new entrant into the human race. The code name is Rai. The rest six wheels are coded in this way. Let us look at their meanings, their judicial scope and leadership responsibilities. We need your encouragement to grow this channel. Subscribe if you have not already done so. Subscribe now and hit the notification button to get notified whenever we post a new video. Discover how to walk the road to everlasting life. Get useful tips for Christian living and eternal life. Discover how God works and how to apply it in your life.
and so much more. We shall now examine the provisions of God for the three broad classes of humans of the wheel of life. Our starting point is the first wheel, Rai. God code named those on the first wheel as Rai. This is a grain crop. Rai, the human on the first wheel is a newcomer to the human race. So this wheel, or the next twelve incarnations form the basis of his foundation or planting on earth. Let us call Rai, Adam, and Eve, for God had just planted them on earth as of Homo sapiens, when Lucifer struck. The purpose of human husbandry is to grow the human race, under God's guidelines for his needs, namely into his many mansions of service, the seven golden candlesticks. The details of Rai's first education courses on the Wheel of Life, for the next twelve incarnations are as follows. 1. The General Curriculum this curriculum is the same for all people under the wheel. But each wheel or category of humans contains a higher version of the same curriculum than the one below it. 2. The specific curriculum. This is the house curriculum on a particular wheel. 3. The ordained provisions. These are the provisions of God for all humans on the wheel, such as provision for the weary to rest, a bit by bit course credit load to ensure that no one is overloaded with learning activities in any lifetime. The details of Rai's first education courses on the Wheel of Life, for the next 12 incarnations are therefore as follows. 1. The General Curriculum First House, The Beginnings Birth sign Aries, March 21 to April 20. Constellation of Stars, Aries. Ruling Planet, Mars. The element here is fire. House theme, Awareness. This is the house of awareness. The specific curriculum of the house. These are the life skills to be acquired in the following areas of life, awareness, beginnings, self-appearances, the body, first impressions, attitude, self-identity, approach to life. Each issue to be learned and practiced is scripted into the person's life lessons to align with the precepts of God, line upon line, letter by letter, on the subject. We have said previously that the newly planted human, Rai starts his first birth in Aries, the beginning of each zodiac wheel, the wheel of life or samsara as the eastern religions call it. Let us see how this is implemented by the gods or husbandmen as the Bible sometimes calls them. The theme of the house is awareness. So, the theme awareness is planted in the person's heart from birth and the feeling of the theme is maintained by the gods until the end of this incarnation. He has no way of knowing that these feelings are not originating from him but placed in his heart by the gods on behalf of God towards his own development in life. The issues relating to his theme that he must cover are, beginnings, self-appearances, the body, first impressions, attitude, self-identity, approach to life. What does the precept of God say about beginnings? What does the precept of God say about self-appearances? What does the precept of God say about the body? We have given the example of Elijah. What does the precept of God say about first impressions? What does the precept of God say about self-identity? What does the precept of God say about one's attitude to life? What does the precept of God say about approach to life? This is the subject matter or destiny of the incarnate into Aries, the first birth house of the wheel of life. But for Rai this is the first of the first. The first incarnation on earth as a beginner on the first house of the first wheel of life. All the issues must be studied and covered along the three domains of learning, namely cognitive domain, thinking and reasoning, affective domain, feelings, and the use of the heart and psychomotor domain, these are the life skills or doing or action.
This is a diagrammatic representation of the constellation of stars that form the zodiac wheel in space. But this is how the spiritual components of the issues of life as the planetary and stellar constellations influences beamed on mankind are represented on paper or stones through the ages. We can see that approach to life, and one's attitude to life, which are the last two items or subjects of this lifetime gives the motto and overview of houses under the wheel. These include the remaining eleven houses or future incarnations of this wheel. Because there is a right and wrong approach, attitude or godly and ungodly approach to every issue. Attitude is the habit that results from our approaches to life. If we continuously approach issues righteously, we acquire good and godly attitudes. On the other hand, if we take others to be fools and do things ungodly continuously, after a time, we are pinned to this state of consciousness to bathe in our cunning attitudes. In Hindu traditions, moksha is a central concept and the utmost aim of human life, the other three aims being dharma, virtue, proper moral life, hrta, material prosperity, income security, means of life, and kama, pleasure, sensuality, emotional fulfillment. Together, these four concepts are called purusartha in Hinduism. Purushartha in Sanskrit literally means an object of human pursuit. It is a key concept in Hinduism, and refers to the four proper goals or aims of a human life. The four purusarthas are dharma, righteousness, moral values, hrta, prosperity, economic values, kama, pleasure, love, psychological values, and moksha, liberation, spiritual values, self-actualization. All four Purusharthas are important, but in cases of conflict, Dharma is considered more important than Urda or Kama in Hindu philosophy. Moksha is considered the ultimate ideal of human life. At the same time, this is not a consensus among all Hindus, and many have different interpretations of the hierarchy, and even as to whether one should exist. Purusartha is a composite Sanskrit word from Purusha and Urda Purusha means spirit immaterial essence, or primeval human being as the soul and original source of the universe, depending on the darsana, the school of thought. Urta in one context means purpose, object of desire and meaning. Together, Purushartha literally means purpose of human being or object of human pursuit. How the Bible puts it. Isaiah 28, verse 9. Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk, and drawn from the breasts. This comment refers directly to Lucifer and his gods, the current husbandmen of the earth. We shall address it later in detail. But for now, let us continue with the issues of the wheel. Verse 10, For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, and there a little. These ensures that the gods teach all the issues of the wheel of life, in line with the precepts of God line by line. In addition, they are to teach a little of each issue of the house at a time. This ensures that no incarnation is overloaded with any issue or issues at any one time. God's Provision for Dream Guidance Isaiah 28, verse 11 for with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. God's provision for the gods to speak with stammering lips and another tongue to the people means that the dreamer is expected to make a little effort to interpret his dream. God's provision for the weary to rest between incarnations of learning activities to refresh themselves on the journey. Isaiah 28, 12 to whom he said, This is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. But Lucifer and his team do otherwise from 740 BC onwards. Isaiah 28, 13 But the word of the Lord was unto them precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, and there a little, that they might go, and fall backward and be broken, and snared, and taken. God's Provision for Judgment at the End Isaiah 28, 
16 Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation a stone, a tried stone, a precious corner stone, a sure foundation, he that believeth shall not make haste. 17 Judgment also will I lay to the lie, and righteousness to the plummet, and the hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies, and the water shall overflow the hiding place. How God coded the human categories with plant names. Isaiah 28, verse 25, When he hath made plain the face thereof, doth he not cast abroad the fitches, and scatter the cumin, and cast in the principal wheat and the appointed barley and re in their place? Verse 26, For his God doth instruct him to discretion, and doth teach him. 27 For the fitches are not threshed with a threshing instrument, neither is a cart wheel turned about upon the cumin, but the fitches are beaten out with a staff, and the cumin with a rod. Verse 28. Bread corn is bruised, because he will not ever be threshing it, nor break it with the wheel of his cart, nor bruise it with his horsemen. 29 This also cometh forth from the Lord of hosts, which is wonderful in counsel and excellent in working. Let us now insert the different human categories on the wheel of life, into Isaiah 28, verses 25 to 29 for a straightforward understanding of the ordinance of human breeding and development. Isaiah 28, verse 25, When he hath made plain the face of the geographical region for the settlement of the people thereof, Doth he not cast abroad the fitches, that is, does he not send abroad the crowned principal judges and leaders, the anointed kings to learn from others before bringing them back home? And scatter the cumin, that is dispersing the prophets of God among the regions of the country and testing their worthiness with the rod of God. And cast in the principal wheat, that is put in the princes, the tribal and regional leaders, and the appointed barley, that is the appointed judges and leaders, the captain of fifties. And re, the newly planted humans on the first zodiac wheel, the wheel of life, in their place. Verse 26, For his God doth instruct him to discretion, and doth teach him. 27 For the fitches are not threshed with a threshing instrument, neither is a cart wheel turned about upon the cumin, but the fitches are beaten out with a staff. That is the anointed kings are separated from the lot, examined or tested with the staff of God, and the cumin, the prophet with a rod of God. In plain language, a person on the seventh and last wheel is tested by how he uses the staff of God given to him, and the prophet of God is tested by how he uses the rod of God given to him. These two instruments of God's work are mentioned by King David in Psalm 23. Psalm 23, 1 The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. 2 He maketh me to lie down in green pastures, he leadeth me beside the still waters. 3 He restoreth my soul, he leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff they comfort me. 5 Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies, thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. 6 Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The following prophets had the rod of God, Moses, King David, King Cyrus of Persia. The rod of God of Moses was the visible type. Exodus 17, 9 And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men, and go out, fight with Amalek, tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. While that of King Cyrus, was the invisible type of the rod of God. King David like King Cyrus was a prophet, serving God as an anointed king, so he had a rod of God as a prophet, as indicated by the word of God in Isaiah 45, verse 1. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden. Isaiah 45, 
1 Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden, to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings, to open before him the two-leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. 2. I will go before thee, and make the crooked places straight, I will break in pieces the gates of brass, and cut in sunder the bars of iron. 3. And I will give thee the treasures of darkness, and hidden riches of secret places, that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by thy name, am the God of Israel. We shall treat the following regarding King Cyrus, in detail, the two-leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut, and the meaning of thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden when we come to the scope and testing of the standard prophets of God. To simplify our study of the Wheel of Life, the first curriculum of the human race, we shall treat all the subjects of a house in each wheel before we go on to the next house. This means for example we shall handle all the incarnations of Aries from the first wheel to the highest wheel, the seventh wheel before we go on to the next birth house. This is necessary to enable us to see how the higher classes or categories of humans are affected by the corresponding higher scope of the house subjects. We are using this method to see how the volume and scope of the same birth house differ on different wheels as we climb up the ladder of life. How does the scope of an Aries king differ from those on the lower wheels? Let us remember that all the seven wheels have the same subjects in each corresponding birth house but the complexities or scope increases with each vertical climb. Let us see how this affects the seven classes of Aries on the wheel of life. Therefore, moving higher let us take the fundamental subjects of Aries for the next wheel, the second wheel of the wheel of life of the human race. Those on the second stage of the wheel of life are known as barley. This is the beginning of leadership and decision making on behalf of God as a leader, judge, and captain of tens. So the newly promoted human Rai, goes on to the second stage of the wheel of life as barley after completing all the twelve houses of the first wheel. He or she may accomplish this in twelve full incarnations of seventy active years. These incarnations may be more, if there are repeat incarnations on account of poor performance, in any one lifetime. But we have earlier said that we will complete the same birth house in the seven wheels before we go on to the next birth house on the same wheel. Therefore, we will treat each birth house from the first to the seventh wheel before we go on to the next birth house. Consequently, let us look at Aries in the second stage of the wheel of life. God coded the second wheel humans as barely in the Bible. So, the identity of barley, a judge of tens, changes from the basic concept of a single soul and his family during his life in the first wheel, into a new one as a leader of tens integrated into the service of God. If we consider that the ten people, he now leads have families, we can say that his responsibilities go beyond a judge of just ten heads, to a judge of ten family units. Since God placed the unit of awareness study in the house of Aries, let us look at it from many angles. To understand how his new consciousness is integrated into the fundamental concept of self-identity let us go to the Eastern religions. What is self-identity? Atman is a Sanskrit word that refers to the, universal, self or self-existent essence of individuals, as distinct from ego, ahamkara, mind, chitta, and embodied existence, prakriti. The term is often translated as soul, but is better translated as self, as it solely refers to pure consciousness or witness consciousness, beyond identification with phenomena. In order to attain moksha, liberation, a human being must acquire self-knowledge, atmagyan or brahmajnana. Atman is a central concept in the various schools of Indian philosophy, which have different views on the relation between Atman, individual self, Jivatman, Supreme Self, Paramatma, and the Ultimate Reality, Braham, stating that they are, completely identical, Advaita, non-dualist, completely different, Dvaita, dualist, or simultaneously non-different and different, Dvaita, non-dualist plus dualist.
The six orthodox schools of Hinduism believe that there is Atman in every living being, Yiva, which is distinct from the body-mind complex. This is a major point of difference with the Buddhist doctrine of Inatta, which holds that in essence there is no unchanging essence or self to be found in the empirical constituents of a living being, staying silent on what it is that is liberated. Some Buddhist traditions assert that Vijnana, consciousness, though constantly changing, exists as a continuum or stream, Santana, and is what undergoes rebirth. In Hinduism, Atma is a Sanskrit word that refers to the, universal, self or self-existent essence of individuals, as distinct from ego, ahamkara, mind, chitta, and embodied existence, prakriti. The term is often translated as soul but is better translated as self, as it solely refers to pure consciousness or witness consciousness, beyond identification with phenomena. In order to attain moksha, liberation, a human being must acquire self-knowledge, atmagyan or brahmajnana. In Hindu traditions, moksha is a central concept and the utmost aim of human life, the other three aims being dharma, virtuous, proper, moral life, hrta, material prosperity, income security, means of life, and kama, pleasure, sensuality, emotional fulfillment. Together, these four concepts are called Purusartha in Hinduism. But in Christianity, Moksha is the liberation from self-pursuit to the integration of self-pursuit with the universal work of God. First, this entails uniting with the Spirit of God as a guide, and then serving as a vehicle for the Holy Spirit to execute God's work. This is what Christ meant when he said in Matthew 11, 27 All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son, but the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father, save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. 28 Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. 29 Take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. 30 For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. By this process, when a soul is weary from God's work, the angels withdraw him or her from the earth to heaven. Revelation 14, 13 And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth, yea, saith the Spirit that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. God withdraws his provision for his spirit as a guide for mankind when evil is exceedingly great in the world. The spirit of God not only acts as a guide, but also as a source of verification of false doctrine. In this era when the gods are appointed by Lucifer, the winter husbandman it is particularly important. Genesis 6, 1 And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, two that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. 3 And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. 4 There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. 5 And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. This guiding principle of the Holy Spirit ensures that it directs the individual to the areas of life where the interest of God is served, while undergoing life's lessons and development. This may lead one to find himself in areas he least expected or had imagined impossible. This is what Jesus meant when he said, Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth, so is every one that is born of the Spirit. The full passage, John 3, 5 Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God.
6 That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. 7 Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. 8 The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth, so is every one that is born of the spirit. This in effect means that we have become the missionaries of God, on the move to areas God deems fit for his use, and for our development. In this regard our awareness, beginnings, self-appearances, the body, first impressions, attitude, self-identity, approach to life changes from that of an individual to that of a missionary of God. From now on we see the bigger picture, our place in the scheme of things, the corporate picture, and how we fit into the overall design. We no longer see things based on our self-interest only, but the larger organizational structure, how it works as a system and our role and responsibilities in it. Remember that at this stage our responsibility is as a leader of tens and their families. We now look at Aries in the third wheel of life called Appointed Barley, the captain and judge of 50s Isaiah 28. Isaiah 28, 23 Give year, and hear my voice, hearken, and hear my speech. 24 Doth the plowman plow all day to sow? Doth he open and break the clods of his ground? 25 When he hath made plain the face thereof, doth he not cast abroad the fitches, and scatter the cumin, and cast in the principal wheat and the appointed barley and re in their place? 26 For his God doth instruct him to discretion, and doth teach him. As barley, the captain and judge of tens govern multiples of tens, so does the appointed barley, govern multiples of the fifties among his people. Again for Aries, the theme is awareness, beginnings, self-appearances, the body, first impressions, attitude, self-identity, approach to life. However, in the third wheel we have to find out and fulfill the life lessons relating to our role in life as a judge and leader of the fifties. The issues relating to his theme that he must cover are, beginnings, self-appearances, the body, first impressions, attitude, self-identity, and approach to life. What do the precepts of God say about beginnings in the third wheel as a captain of the fifties? What do the precepts of God say about self-appearances of a judge of the fifties? What do the precepts of God say about the body? We have given the example of Elijah. The body is a vehicle for God's work. We live in it and do not fear those that will kill the body when we use it as a vehicle for God's work. But we fear God who can kill both body and soul. What do the precepts of God say about the first impressions of a leader of fifties? What do the precepts of God say about the self-identity of a judge of fifties? What do the precepts of God say about approach to life? For we must learn all these and much more to approach the Father of Light, our Creator. At the end of this age, when the harvest and judgment of the world come, Jesus said, those that are worthy among humans will become angels, hear him out. Luke 20 34, and Jesus answering said unto them, the children of this world marry, and are given in marriage. 35. But they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world, and the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage. 36. Neither can they die any more, for they are equal unto the angels, and are the children of God, being the children of the resurrection. If you like to study further how God breeds humans, until they become angels and immortal, then click the video on your right. In this video we face the reality of what God may demand of us, when we meet him face to face as our Heavenly Father. By contemplating on the words of God in this video, we are able to appreciate the magnitude of God's gift in creating us in his own image. Here, the mystery of the inherent capacity of the human brain is clarified, for we are limitless compared to our present abilities. The lessons go on. What are your abilities and duties when you become an angel of God? Find out in the questions God asks Job. 24 By what way is the light parted, which scattereth the east wind upon the earth? 
25 who hath divided a watercourse for the overflowing of waters or a way for the lightning of thunder thank you for watching you can support this channel with a donation or become our patreon see the links below for details